Hello, Hubble Huggers, and welcome to another Hubble Hangout, to our latest humble Hubble Hangout, our hearty and happy Hubble. Okay, I'll stop. I, wow, uh, the, the alliteration just, is strong in this one. Well, it's easy with H's. It's easy to alliterate with H's. H's. So anyway, um, so I guess of all the Hubble Hangouts I've done so far, I'm particularly excited about this one because the topic of this one is about something very near and dear to my heart. It is not an exaggeration to say that images from the Hubble Space Telescope have literally changed my life. And I don't mean that as a figure of speech. I could go on. That could be the subject of its own hangout, actually. But uh, the images that the Hubble Space Telescope have taken have profoundly affected me. And so for... and and have ultimately uh, led me here uh, with this great group of people that I'm about to introduce to you uh, to talk about the Hubble Space Telescope and the images from it. So let me get started by introducing my co-hosts or cohorts or cohabitant. No, we don't live together, but um, our, our, uh, with me is uh, my, one of my co-hosts, Alberto Conti. Alberto! Hi, Tony. How are you? Welcome. Yes, he nice is the JWST here. Innovation Scientist. And now, Berto, real quick, I know this is about Hubble, but i got to ask real quick, um, how are things going with JWST? We still on track? Everything is still on track. We have a new instrument just delivered to Goddard uh, a few days ago, and we have one is going into uh, the cryo chamber for testing, so we're really doing well. Awesome. So we're uh, we're still launching in 2018 then. Nobody's yep. dropped a primary or sneezed on the secondary or anything. Good. Not yet. No. Awesome. We, awesome. we won't. Okay. <laughs> Not because yes. they wear masks, right? In the, <laughs> right. Yeah, that's right. They have those sneeze, guys. Yeah. those sneeze guards yeah. and everything. Okay, cool. Yeah. All right. Also with me is Scott Lewis from KnowTheCosmos.com. Hi, Scott. Hey, Tony. How's it going? Hey, Scotty. Okay, can I call you that? Can I call you Scotty? You could for like once. Oh, <laughs> no, come on. No, I, I'm going to call you Scotty now. And then, then maybe in tomorrow's hangout, we'll give you a tagline. Because for me, it's like I stole uh, Keep Looking Up from Jack Horkheimer. And of course, Alberto's is Get Her Done. So we got to have true. we got to have one for you, oh, too. Oh, boy. Yeah. See, yeah, now we're going to have the YouTube commenters start calling me Scotty when I do Space <laughs> Scotty! Video. Yes, you being hey. the oh. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, Scott. It's good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Um, so uh, the, let me talk a little bit about, the, before I introduce our other our astronomers, I would like to get uh, sort of to the point of what we're doing here. What are we doing and why? And we're kind of doing a social experiment this time around, where at the Institute we are compiling a list of the greatest images ever taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And to do that, we want to get you involved and to get you help, or get to get uh, your help. So to get our brains kind of kick-started into thinking about uh, what, what images there are and, and, and what, what do we mean by the greatest images, let me introduce some of the people with me now. And we, we have, these guys to me are all rock stars. I mean, I have heard about them long before I ever met them, and, and I'm just really thrilled to have them with me uh, on this Hangout today. Let me start with Carol. I'm just going to go from left to right. So with me is Dr. Carol Christian. Hi, Carol. Hello. How are Hi, you? Well, I'm good, thanks. And uh, now you were famous long before I met you because for many years you did the uh, you did the the radio show on MP on NPR uh, Skywatch, and so yeah. I knew about you way before I met you. It's, it's a pleasure to finally be in a hangout with you, though. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. What do you what do you do so, all day? In addition to Skywatch, um, which we're looking to move to mobile media and the internet. Um, I'm actually the Hubble Space Telescope Outreach Scientist, which actually to me is one of the best jobs in astronomy. Um, it means that they pay me to read all of the research literature, which many astronomers, you know, they have to carve out some time of their day to do that, but I get to do that as part of my job. So I get to see all the different research that's being done, and then I also support the news and the education products that are derived from those discoveries. So scientists are doing using the Hubble Space Telescope, making new discoveries, and then we roll that into news and education, and so I help do that. And it's like a great job. And the thing that's near and dear to my heart is citizen science. So that's the kind of science where we invite you to participate in our research by helping us find new galaxies, um, identify star clusters, um, maybe look for star formation bubbles in the Milky Way. Um, all of those things are possible for you to participate in. And uh, I'm 
pursuing some of those projects with my colleagues. Oh, I know, yeah, I know just how you feel about you know having the greatest job in the world. It's like I, sometimes I can't believe that I get paid to to deal with you know the Hubble Space Telescope every single day. So I know just what you mean. I think we're going to be doing a hangout at some point in the future on some of those citizen science things too that you talked about. I hope so. so yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so crammed all together in one room, we have <laughs> three astronomers who are extremely. Uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, awesome, awesome guys. So, with is Dr. Frank Summers. Hi, Frank. Hey, Tony. How's it going today? Really good. So, uh, you are? I am an outreach astrophysicist, outreach astronomer in the Office of Public Outreach here at Space Telescope Science Institute. So, I also get to talk about uh, the amazing things that Hubble does, working on the press releases, working on uh, educational projects, giving teacher training talks, uh, working with planetariums and museums, uh, working on the website, uh, doing all sorts of cool stuff. But you, as you know, my favorite thing to do is uh, scientific visualization. I was the scientific visualization supervisor on IMAX Hubble 3D. And together with Zolt LeVay, who you'll introduce in just a bit, uh, we have a group here, the Visualization 3D team, that we take Hubble images, we visualize, we uh, create three-dimensional models of them, fly cameras through them, and uh, are able to explain the universe uh, through 3D visualizations. That's what I like to do best. Awesome. And then right next to him is Dr. Mario Liv Livio. Hi, Mario. Hi. Go ahead. Y yeah, well, I'm an <laughs> astrophysicist. I do... I'm a theoretical astrophysicist, which means I hardly know from which side of the telescope one looks, <laughs> but I, I look at what those astronomers are coming down with, and I'm trying to explain all of that and explain the universe. Uh, in my spare time, I write a blog called The Curious Mind, uh, which hopefully everybody reads. And in my non-existent spare time, uh -huh. I try to write popular science books, <clears throat> Uh, the latest of which is called Brilliant Blunders, uh, where I try to explain all kinds of complex scientific issues in a layperson's language uh, to make a science more accessible to a larger a group of people. Uh, I've been with Hubble for many, many years, uh, uh, almost since launch, uh, and uh, you know, I like every minute of it, and uh, I'm sure I'll continue to like it, and hopefully also with uh, the James Webb Space Telescope. All right, awesome. Thank you, thank you, Mario. And I am also very pleased that Dr. Ken Sembach could be with us today. Uh, Ken is like the Hubble guy at the at the, at the institute. Ken, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, Tony. I'm the Hubble guy at the institute. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was simple. Glad you could make it. Oh, so this is, on. This is well, the humble on. Hubble guy. The right. humble right. Hubble guy. Yeah. yeah. So, so, Tony, my my day job is to uh, basically watch out over all things Hubble. Here, I'm the head of the Hubble mission office here at the Space Telescope, and I have the privilege of working with uh, many, many wonderful people here and at uh, the Goddard Space Flight Center every day to keep Hubble operating efficiently and uh, producing all that great science it produces. I'm trained as an astronomer, so it's a particularly satisfying job. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. And like I said, welcome. I'm really glad you are able to make it. And skipping over Scott and me, who we already have introduced ourselves, with me is Zolt LeVay. He also is, uh, he is the Hubble Heritage Team Lead, and he's one of the guys that are sort of responsible for giving us some of the most beautiful images Hubble has ever created. Hi, Zolt. Welcome. Hi, Tony. Hi, everybody. Uh, yeah, what what more can I say? I uh, <laughs> had the privilege of uh, uh, putting together a lot of these Hubble pictures from the data. So we take the data out of the archive and uh, put the images together and make so them available to everybody. So in some way, we are really showing your work today, sort of, right? Uh, a lot of my work and a lot of other people's work. That's right. That's so right. I work with a team. Uh, uh, Tony talked about the Hubble Heritage Team. Uh, this is a group of folks here at the Institute who have been, uh, for a number of years now, have been trying to find and publicize the visually best, the aesthetically best, mm -hmm. uh, if you will, images from Hubble. Not so much concentrate on the science aspect of it, but more the visual aspects of it. And I think that all goes into what we're going to talk about today a little yep. bit. Yep. Yeah, so there you go, guys. There's there's the there's our panel of astronomers and uh, people working on the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. 
I guess so. And we decided here at the institute, like like I mentioned at the top of this uh, hangout, that we're putting together a list, a comprehensive list as best can be done. And because we operate the world, the uh, Hubble Space Telescope, and we've just given you our credentials, this list will be the official one. <laughs> the, uh, the, <laughs> uh, we are the governing body for the and much too latest. long one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. And so because uh, these images will be the greatest. They will be canonized as the greatest images. But first, we have to kind of talk about what we mean by that. What do we mean by greatest? I mean, I know why, for example, I'm greatest uh, at, you know, whatever it is I do, but I, I don't know what we mean by great Hubble images. And I guess you could think of it in two ways. There are the greatest images that have produced the most scientifically uh, useful uh, data or have made us look at the universe in a way we n may uh, have never done before. And then there's just the pretty pictures. There's the most beautiful Hubble images. Those are also great and have their own. So when we say greatest, we mean all of it to combine both, both because what may be scientifically quite amazing and great doesn't necessarily mean they're pretty. So we want to kind of talk about all of that together. And we are all, as a team, going to sit and discuss which ones mean the most to us. So as um, Mario mentioned that the Hubble's been around since 1990. It has been around a really, really long time. And I guess the first thing I'd like to, to ask you guys is, um, why, why is that? Why is Hubble one of the ones that, of all the space telescopes, it's still around. It's still kicking. It's still alive and well and, and doing, doing great things. Who wants to try? Well, any, of us, any one of us could try to answer that. <laughs> Go for it. Well, Hubble was built as, a, from the beginning, Hubble was built as a serviceable telescope, which meant that uh, shuttle astronauts could get to Hubble. Uh, Hubble is in a low Earth orbit. Uh, they could grapple Hubble, and they could take out old instruments and put in new ones. They could also repair old instruments and so on. So in some sense, you know, because Hubble was serviced five times, uh, it was actually at every such time that it was serviced by the shuttle, it was made almost into a new telescope in the sense that it had new instruments on board, uh, things that needed re to repairs were made, and, and so on. So uh, this gave it, it its enormous uh, longevity, but not only just longevity, but also productivity, because it you know essentially renewed itself with every servicing mission. Right, and like Spitzer, you know, had enough cryogen to last for, what, five or six years, and then it had to go into its war mission, right? And we were able to go and replace the batteries, and replace gyroscopes, and, and, you know, all of the consumables on Hubble were able to be replaced, and that allowed it to be so long. Yeah, that was part of the... I mean, part of it is the logistics associated with just making Hubble a new telescope, but the telescope has staying power in that it has public appeal, and it has public appeal right from the start. Right. And why do, you, why do you think that is, Ken? Why do you think the, the public appeal is so strong for this telescope? Well, I think early on when Hubble had some initial problems with the mirror, <laughs> the mirror configuration and the astronauts were able to go up and repair it, there was a great human interaction with the telescope that resonates with people. Drama. Really there was drama. Yeah, real drama, exactly. And the fact that when the astronauts repaired the vision on Hubble, that it, the telescope was able to produce such sensational pictures, it gave the public an immediate visual representation of what was possible with this telescope that they hadn't seen before. And I think that was just the start of what's been, you know, 20 plus year history. Uh, yeah, so I think that's images. Yeah, in that sense, do you think, Ken, so it really did open a new era for astronomy? Oh, absolutely, in many ways. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and, 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 and I, oh, that's happened ahead. with some of the Im imagery is that the, the imagery has public appeal. We make sure that the imagery gets out there and all of the data and all the discoveries. And in fact, when we started putting these images out more than 20 years ago, all of a sudden we started seeing other sciences doing the same thing. I mean, they were like trying to find the, the coolest images of biological organisms and medical imaging and all that. And so it's really sort of changed the way that scientists present their science and in astronomy um, we have the beautiful cosmos to bring to the public. 
Yeah, and I know what you mean about the drama part of the uh, uh, the repair part because I remember back in when I, in my former life when I was in the solar physics, the, the Solar Maxima mission was one of the first, if not the first, uh, uh, telescope to get repaired by a shuttle, and that opened up a lot of interest in in uh, solar astronomy, whereas before there wasn't before. Um, so, okay, so I know for me, from personal experience, uh, the scientific images that have come off of Hubble have been what has affected me the most. The pretty, the, 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 the beautiful, aesthetically pleasing ones were certainly great, but it was the scientific, once I, in fact, not just, in fact, if you look at the deep field, which is the one I, that first caught my attention, that's not a particularly pretty picture. It's just a bunch of fuzzy dots everywhere, but it was how it was taken that really captured my imagination. What do you guys think is, uh, it, it well, I'm asking a bunch of astronomers this. Which one do you think is more important, uh, the science or the aesthetics? But uh, let's go ahead and do it. Which one? Which one do you think has a bigger impact on the public? Well, I think I think the aesthetics has a bigger impact on the public. Uh, but I think that the fact that every now and then you come up with a really big discovery, and plus that with Hubble, as Carol described we have managed actually to take the excitement of discovery and bring it into the homes of people all across the globe, uh, that has made the scientific part also important for the general public. But there is no question that, you know, much of the popularity of Hubble derives from those just astounding images. Right, and I would take that a little further because the, the beauty allows you to go in and present the science. When I do the teacher training talks and I, I talk to all of them, you can shoot the, the images get the attention and they want to know more. And that is such an easy way to, to segue into, okay, now here's what it really means. Here's the science behind it. Here's that amazing astronomy that we discovered using this image. And so it's the combination that really allow, gives it you know, such, such, such the, truth, the fact that there's truth behind the beauty makes it that much more powerful. And Tony, I'll say that a little bit in defense of your favorite image, which isn't necessarily my favorite image, but for the Hubble Deep Field, we actually, the original Hubble Deep Field, we made this big, big display of it, and we had it out in the public, and we could see people walk up to it, you know, a few people together, and they would start classifying the galaxies, and then sometimes, you know, an astronomer would go over and say, do you know what you're doing? You're doing science. <laughs> what? What? I'm doing science? But oh my god, a, stop that! A, yeah, really, it was a very engaging way, of, as Frank says, of those images make people start to ask questions about what is it? Why does it look like this? Yeah. With, the deep, with the deep field, it's... Go ahead, Albert. No, no, no. Go ahead, Ken. I think I'm going to say exactly what you're going to say. <laughs> say with the deep with the deep field, that's a really interesting case because, as Tony was saying, it may not be the most visually striking image when you just look at it in sort of a cursory fashion, but when you show people it and you start to explain to them what it is that they're seeing, it, it you know it starts them thinking about what it means. Exactly. And, and then suddenly the beauty of that image is apparent. That you know, whereas just from a visual standpoint, an immediate visual impact, it might not have been before. And I think Car Carol was basically getting to the same thing. Yeah. When people start talking uh, about what's in it and right. doing something with the image, it becomes mo a lot more interesting. When you say that in that image, every point of light, essentially, that you yeah, see there yeah. is a galaxy with a hundred billion stars like the sun, uh, you know, this you literally staggers small. people and you know uh, yep. it, it also yep. gives them a strong sense of you know our place in the cosmos I, I, I was actually going to say exactly that because I think it's uh, you know was a, an eye opener in so many ways and perhaps I find it extremely beautiful but I guess I'm biased but uh, I suppose that it's also a uh, it puts something into perspective as Mario said because when you when you sort of look at this completely blank patch of the sky where we pointed our telescope and we see 10,000 galaxies or 3,000 galaxies in the case of the Hubble Deep Field for example and then you and then as Mario said you point out that every little dot there is a galaxy that it's either forming or it's similar to our own that's quite mind-boggling and it does you know have a very very different feel to um, uh, you know for us humans you know you sort of put something in a different perspective and it's actually it's quiet uh, I mean I remember you know when he came out I was a graduate student it was quite dramatic and people wanted to know more and he has told us so much more about just uh, you know just galaxies in general and it's it's a fascinating image 
Oh, I know. And and I mean, I've I've seen it plenty of times before, but it wasn't until I learned how it was taken and the context of that image that I couldn't stop thinking about it. It absolutely blew me away. It was like, you know, we stared at this blank spot in the sky for all this time for hours and hours and built up this image that was filled with galaxies in it. So let me ask you this. These images, I, this this image in particular, I think was taken using um, uh, Hubble's, there's, there's this thing called director's discretionary time or something like that, right? That's where you can just sort of decide how to take a picture. Correct, uh, correct. Was anybody worried about how that would turn out? You know, was anybody worried? Was it a risk to uh, to take this image, point the telescope, a very valuable piece of um, hardware, at nothing? Yeah, there were there were many prominent astronomers saying that that was going to be a waste of time, wow. sci scientifically. And uh, you know, the the results speak for themselves. It's one of the most uh, you know productive projects that Hubble's ever undertaken in terms of the number of scientific papers and citations and so on yep. that come out. And we've repeated it uh, several times with the, the ultra-deep yeah. field in the 2009, right. the right. 2010. No, it was a very controversial I uh, I, I want to remind time. everybody also that the area of the sky you are looking at here is yeah. just about something like what you would see if you looked through a drinking straw. Yeah. So, I mean, that gives you another impression of what right. it is you're seeing. There's very than, tiny patch. Exactly. Well, there's more than 10 million patches on the whole night sky of this size. So the whole night sky, you'd have to tile this over 10 million times to cover the whole night sky. And, if you, if, and if you do the math, you see that in the, in the observable <laughs> universe, <laughs> there should be something like 200 billion yeah. galaxies. Do we all feel small enough now? We all feel small yeah. enough. <laughs> Have a nice day. Okay, now we're going to come back to this image in just a bit, but I, I, it occurred to me that I have, I have been neglectful in not telling people how they can participate. So we're building this list, but we want you to help us build it. And the way we want you to help us build it is to comment. Tell us which ones you think are Hubble's greatest images. But don't just post a link on the comment thing of this uh, event page or anything. You know, Put some effort in it. Tell us why it's, it's important. Why is that image great? And because we're going to all take a look at this and build the, build the list based on your input. So the way you can let us know is you could you could comment on this event page if you want to. You can go to our Facebook page, the uh, Facebook.com slash Hubble Telescope and, 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 and interact with us there. You can tweet using the hashtag that you see here on my lower third called Hubble Top Shots. You can also use that on uh, on the G Plus page as well. Um, also we have a Hubble Space Telescope community. The link to that community is on the event page of this uh, of, on G+. I would encourage you to join that community. Make your posts there. Discuss other people's pictures. Plus one it. Um, tell them why you think it's a good idea or a bad idea that that image be included. But interact with us. Let us know what you think because this is it. Like I said, this is going to be the list. And if you want to be a part of it, you're going to have to... It, Prove it. Prove it. Prove it to us that these are. This is in fact a great image from Hubble. So and there. I wanted to. So if you're with us on Google Plus as well on the event page, if there's something that you found from the Hubble Site Gallery, take the image itself and put it into the event page. So you're not only sharing which image, the title of it, but you can actually show the world exactly what you're talking about and why it is that important to you. Yeah. So we want your input and we want you to tell us what the greatest images are. So let's get to some specifics. Uh, who wants to give us their, fir their their favorite image? Who wants to go first? Oh, Tony, nobody's oh, speaking up. I'll do it. Okay, go, go it. ahead, Ken. Go, Ken. Uh, I, I like Abel 370. <laughs> and that's and a picture, and why do you like that? Uh, this, this picture I like for several reasons. Um, the first reason is that it was one of the first uh, things that we looked at with the advanced camera for surveys after it was repaired during servicing mission four. So it has kind of a personal uh, investment in it that uh, a lot of the people have here that uh, we have a lot of pride in. But scientifically I like it uh, very much because it shows the effects of gravitational lensing. That is the universe itself acting as a lens on the light that's coming from very far away. And in particular you don't need to be a scientist to appreciate what's going on in this image. You can look at it and know just from looking at it that, in fact, matter warps space enough to distort light. And you can see that in these arcs um, 
and, and various trails that you see around this image. The light from distant galaxies gets warped or uh, transmitted through this lens, this gravitational lens of this foreground cluster, and um, you end up with these arcs. The big arc on the right is particularly striking. Um, again, there you can see that not only is that cluster in the center of the image warping the light and pulling that light of a distant galaxy into the background uh, of the background galaxy into that magnificent arc on the right hand side. But if you look along that arc, you see that each time that arc light passes one of the nearer galaxies, the galaxies themselves warp that light. So Einstein was right. You can tell that just by looking at this picture without having to know really any of the physics that's going on. I think it's right. just an incredible picture. Agreed. And, and so just to clarify, this is a this is a cluster of galaxies, and each one of these dots and smears is a galaxy in here. But every once in a while, what you'll see are these kind of long, stretched out looking, stretchy things. And th those are individual galaxies who, whose light has been warped by the gravity of these other galaxies around it. Now, this, this one really dramatic arc on the right, if that one is the one that is being stretched out. By, is it by this elliptical galaxy here or in the right next to it there, or is it some unseen material somewhere? There, there are two concentrations of gas in this, uh, of matter in this image. One is right on the center of the image, and that's the main one that's, that's stretching out that light of that arc. And you can actually see the galaxy within that arc repeated yeah. multiple times at both the head and the tail of that arc, for example. And then, as I was saying earlier, there's also a shape induced on that arc by the individual galaxies that are near to that arc on the sky. And you can see that the light, the, the arc kind of bends around each of those galaxies there. Uh, let me only clarify, Tony, that that galaxy, that the light of which you're, see, uh, you're seeing as being stretched like this, that galaxy is actually much farther yes. than the cluster of galaxies that you see. So what happens is that the cluster of galaxies acts like a lens between us and the more distant galaxy, and by warping its light, it causes all these shapes that you see and this stretching of the light. I remember the first time I saw that, it was amazing. Oh, go ahead, Frank. Well, I was going to say, I like to call this visual proof of general relativity. Yeah. Because, I mean, when you learn general relativity in graduate school, it's the Christoffel symbols and all these Riemann tensors and everything. It's all this complicated mathematics. But you just have to look at this image from Hubble, and you can see the effects of general relativity in it. Is uh, Hubble the first telescope to ever get this? I'll get to you just a sec, Carol. Sorry. I, I, is, uh, is, is, is the Hubble the first one to be able to take an image of gravitational lensing like this? No. No. Okay. There, there, but there have been telescopes on the ground that have certainly done this, but none to the type of resolution or the depth of field that Hubble has been able to, to do. Got it. Sorry I interrupted, Carol. Go ahead. That's okay. We have many beautiful examples. Uh, one of my favorites is Abel 2218, but I wanted to bring up a teaser, an appetizer, because Ooh, it, an appetizer is that um, in in the fall and over the next uh, several years, we have a group that is working on six lensing clusters, and the project is called Frontiers Fields, mm. and the idea is to look at these six clusters, and then there will be theoretical models to understand in detail what the mass distribution of the cluster is and also information about the more distant galaxies which are being lensed. And so there'll be six examples and people are already working on those even before the Hubble observations are being taken. And another really interesting thing is that other observatories are already planning and starting observations of the same cluster. So we're going to have all kinds of information, X-ray, infrared, Hubble, um, ground-based observations of these six clusters that will be a, coming out over the next couple of years. And so you should stay tuned and you might be able to participate in trying to find some of those little lens pieces um, when we get those observations. <laughs> Sorry, and someone's um, calling me about that right now. That's right. They, they want to know run more. To your, run to your field. <laughs> sign me uh, up. Let, let me just let me just mention that uh, th these are observations uh, indeed for the.
coming future, but there already are observations. There is a program called CLASH, uh, which looked at 25 such clusters and produced some already some incredible results, including lensing and many other results. Uh, and those results are coming out right now as we speak. Okay, cl yes. uh, acronym test. I have to remind my CLASH, uh, Cluster Lensing and... Supernova something. Search with Hubble? Exactly. Supernova yeah. Search, yeah. yeah. Thank Good you. Part, Frank guys. wins. Frank wins. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I, only because Ken, Ken uh, checked me on it. <laughs> oh, okay. another, another advertisement, this is another teaser, is that these, these uh, lensed objects, and this is advertisement for the JWST scientists here among the group, is that um, in some cases, some of these little galaxies that are being lensed, we, if, if the massive cluster in the front wasn't there, we couldn't actually see it. So this is a clue of what we're going to see with the James Webb Telescope in the future because the James Webb Telescope is much bigger and it will see these galaxies directly. So this is Hubble's little lens preview of what's to come over there. Yeah, I'm, got, I'm glad you brought that up because that's an important part of the, the Frontier Fields thing, I think, is to using gravity yep. as lens as lenses to make Hubble more powerful than it would otherwise be. And so it can see a little bit further back and get galaxies it wouldn't see without the help of gravitational lensing. And I think, in fact, I'm, I've been trying to get Jennifer involved in this too, I think we're going to have a hangout on this pretty soon. Alberto, we're going to have to... I'm going to have to get that going. So, yeah. because, Okay, let's talk about some more images. Zolt, let me get you in on this. You've been awful okay. quiet. I you want you to go what? in a different direction here? Yes, please. Go. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll go in a, maybe I'll go in a more aesthetic direction. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, let, me, let me turn on my screen and uh, let's see here. Start screen share. Okay, I have you embiggened, so go ahead. Okay. Um, there you go. So I'm going to talk about this Carina Nebula image. Can you all see it? Yep, sure can. Um, this is actually is one of my favorites. Uh, it's hard to pick a favorite, obviously. There's so many. But um, this is actually one of the largest in terms of resolution, in terms of number of pixels, one of the largest images that we've made uh, from Hubble. What is the resolution? Uh, it's uh, The pixel size is uh, 32,000 by 16,000 roughly. So it's about a half a billion pixels. So this uh, is a mosaic then, right? This, this is the is Hubble mosaic. camera is not this big. So This is 16 separate frames stitched together. There's another odd thing about this image. Uh, well, maybe it's not odd, but another unusual thing about this image <laughs> is this is a combination of Hubble data and ground-based data. So the Hubble uh, ACS camera took images in the light of hydrogen. So it's H-alpha and um, but that's all that Hubble had for this um, large mosaic. But we were able to take an image from a ground-based telescope from the Ceratololo, which took an image uh, of a much actually much wider field image. And uh, but that was taken in three different filters, in the light of hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen. And from that image, we were able to make a color composite. And so we took the color information from the ground-based image, but we're able to uh, combine that with the black and white image from Hubble, which has much higher resolution. But we're able to preserve all the resolution from the Hubble data, but but uh, layer in the color from the ground-based data. Wow. So if you zoom into this image, I mean, this is showing a much reduced resolution. If you zoom into this image, you just see it's extraordinary. You see these little tiny knots where there's uh, the, the gas and dust are condensing and new stars are being formed. Uh, there's just stars being formed all over this this region of uh, uh, the Carina Nebula. And so, yeah, how many sub images did we use as pictures, uh, individual picture releases from this image? Because I can count at least three or four of them, right? Uh, well, we yeah we had several cutouts that we released at this time, and then the other uh, thing we did was. Uh, there's a remarkable spot on this image. In this particular place, it's kind of in the upper uh, or middle right portion of the image. You see this kind of funny-looking um, thing that looks kind of like a mountain uh, on its side. And we were able later to take another image with the new camera, with the WIPC-3, uh, and all do three filters with Hubble. So we made a color image from all Hubble data. Um, this is the image that we released for Hubble's 20th anniversary three years ago. 
Um, and, and which we call Mystic Mountain. Mystic Mountain, yes. That's your name, right, Mario? You <laughs> gave it that. You christened it, right? Yeah, I, I gave that name. <laughs> and we, and oh, I thought we were supposed to start calling Mario Mystic Mountain. Mystic something, maybe. No, no, that, that's Matt's nickname. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay so, so in addition to being amazingly beautiful, there, can, there is can we see that image, by the way? Yeah, uh, I'm Mr. pulling Mount, it up. Yes, uh, actually, this is in. Uh, let me. No, that's not it. Uh, 2010-13A. Wait a minute, just I hang on. Up, up, here's here it is. Oh, there's another one too. There, yes, yes. That's it. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Put it back. Which one? No, I have I have it on my screen. You should be able to see it. Yeah, yeah, we see it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I have yes. it. I have it, and you're big. Yeah. So. I have the old one either. So. So this yeah. is the this is actually a wider view than we we initially released, but it really shows well the um, at the very tip of the the, the tallest pillar. Uh, you see jets coming out uh, on either side, and that's a telltale signature of a new star being formed down in there. So. Um, that's so what are, what like are those what are those flares? That's not a that, that's that's an actual feature. That's not a, that's not an optical artifact or anything. It's a real. Uh, that's a real that a feature. Yeah. Optical actual... artifact. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know how on these stars you see these spikes here. That's not. Yeah. No, no, those are the jets. entire thing's a smudge. <laughs> Th those are smudge. <laughs> those are jets coming from uh, when a new star is being born. Uh, there is a, like a disk formed around it. And from the center of that disk, there are jets that emanate to both sides, and those are the jets that you see. The birth announcement of his new star, newborn star. Yeah, it's um, it's like a. So tell us a little bit about the camera that took this. Um, this was this was taken with the WIF C3, is that right, or? Yeah, Ken maybe yeah. wants to talk about that. Yeah. yeah, so so that was the new infrared camera that infrared and optical UV camera, panchromatic camera that was installed during the servicing mission in uh, May of 2009. So what's so great about that? Why do we what why do we want uh, images in the infrared? Why uh, why is that important? Well, it allows you to see through uh, a lot of the dust that often obscures the ultraviolet and the optical regions uh, in some of these images, and so you can actually look into star forming regions like this. In some cases you can actually look right through them uh, and see, you know, see astronomical phenomena that you wouldn't have been able to see otherwise. There are some really good examples in the um, the uh, Hubble site uh, gallery where you can blink the optical and the infrared images together. I don't know if we can pull any of those up. Yeah, those are I've seen well, those. Those are really great. Those are they, they kind of fade from the visual to the or the optical to the uh, near infrared, and those are well. You know, I can really I can lot. show one of the infrared images. The uh, let me show the horse head image. Yeah, yes, show that. I was yeah. hoping you would do that because the <laughs> horse head is like stunning. It's one of my favorites. No, this just came out. Yes. Well, this was we did yeah a few months ago, uh, and again an anniversary commemoration to commemorate the 23rd anniversary. Um, so, the horse head, of course, is this this object that every astronomer uh, likes looking at. Um, so we decided to do it in the infrared, and this was a, I mean, a, maybe not as big a gamble as the Hubble Deep Field was, but it was a little bit of a gamble because we didn't quite know what we would would be getting. Um, but we did want to exercise the infrared camera a little bit, and so we took two uh, filters with the infrared camera, and this is a color composite of those two filters, and it's, to me, really remarkable because uh, we're seeing uh, the, the horse head itself almost in a negative view from what you see in the visible. So what's bright here largely is dark in the visible, and in addition to that, we're seeing into the nebula, but we're also seeing behind the nebula, whereas in the invisible light at the top of the image, it's very bright, and we're not seeing anything behind it. But here, that, that uh, material becomes completely transparent, and we're able to see stars and even very distant galaxies much farther away, right straight through this nebula. And so it's uh, really remarkable. 
Yeah, Zolt, so one of Zolt, the... Zolt is telling a very benign story here, but Mario and I can attest that we had many discussions about taking this data, many arguments <laughs> about exactly what filters we were going to use. Oh, we're not going to see anything, blah, blah, blah. And when the image came out, we were all just... Stunned. We were blown away. Like, oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me just add something, Tony, because you asked why do we want an infrared camera at all. So, of course, an, another big reason is that because the universe is expanding, uh, light from very Good. distant yep. objects... I was hoping somebody would say that. Uh, is, uh, <laughs> light from very distant galaxies is actually redshifted. It is shifted towards the red, and if you go even farther into the infrared. Yep. So if you want to study the very distant universe, the way to go is the infrared, and that's the reason why the James Webb Space Telescope it will actually look exclusively in the infrared. That's so, right. Uh, that's I always say the uh, future of astronomy is in the infrared. Yes, yeah. it is. I was actually, yeah, Surely. I was actually, I was actually showing some work that Frank did actually uh, from the Horse and Nebula, where you can actually, since we have a little more information than just uh, a two-dimensional image, we can actually do a 3D. Maybe Frank, you want to talk about the 3D Horse and Nebula is, tour? Yeah, this is a visualization that Zolt and I and our team and Greg and Lisa did. Uh, just a very simple camera move to show you the three-dimensionality of the nebula because, you know, what really makes it real cool is that if you uh, do a, uh, a cross-fade from the visible to the infrared, you're playing the ESA version, not the Hubble side yeah, version. Yeah, correct. All right, what the Hubble side version has, has, has the cool cross-fade from the visible light to the infrared light. You just see how, how, how much more we see with the infrared, and it becomes visually obvious why we really want to use both wavelengths. Yeah, let me see if I can try to find well, that. That's amazing work, Frank. I, I love that simu that, that, that fly-through. It's really good. Tony, when that image came out, one of the engineers here changed the way that I look at that nebula forever. And he said, I, I asked him, uh, what did he think of the image? And he said, I never realized there were so many galaxies behind. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, yeah. if, if, if you yeah. go, again, if you go to Hubble site and you look at it up at, at the real nice resolution that you can get there, there are just hundreds of galaxies behind this thing. It's, it's amazing. That's another point we should emphasize, that when you go to Hubble site, you get every pixel that we as the astronomers see. Yeah. So you want to look at that image in all its glory, you get every single pixel we see, so you can see all those galaxies that yeah. we look at. I mean, this, the horse head's 20 degrees off the galactic plane, so it's up out of the dust, most of the dust of the disk, and then with the infrared camera, you can see right through the dust of this region um, to those background galaxies, as you, as you noted before. Okay, before we leave this image, I just want to point. I want to ask you guys a question that that uh, I was wondering about. What is the effect? I mean, it, right next to the horse head is a really bright star. Uh, I believe it's Zeta Orionis. Is that right? Uh, really, what what effect do really bright stars have on Hubble? Do Tony, we have are, you talking, are you talking about Sigma Orionis, the one that's actually? Uh, it, it could be. Yeah, the, the uh, one that's right uh, next to front? it. The one there's a really bright star that when the I when I was looking. To it. That is, one needs to. Yeah, it's very. It's within a field of view of a small telescope. But I, I was just, uh, I was just wondering when you're getting close to bright stars or objects that are close to very bright stars like that, is it a danger to Hubble? I mean, do we have to take any precautions? It you, depends. you mean when we point near the telescope is not getting near a bright star? <laughs> it's we're pointing near. <laughs> pointing right? near. Thank the, you, Carol. The telescope stays with us. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, it's not pulling a comet Ison and grazing. <laughs> That'd be kind of cool, though. Come on. Yeah. <clears throat> Tony, the answer. What it is pointing near. Yeah. Yes. The answer to your question depends on what instrument we're using to look at the uh, at the nebula or the the star that's near the nebula. In some cases, it could pose a health and safety risk to the instrumentation by overlighting the detectors. Um, in other cases. Um, it might just end up saturating the detector, in which case, um, you know, the worst thing that might happen is that the detector uh, kind of blurs out in that particular image, but then recovers fully from the exposure afterwards. Let me point out that there is one star that you definitely don't want to point the telescope to. <laughs> yeah, that's the sun. Oh, that's yeah, that. yeah. Now, we take special, yeah, lots of precautions true. are taken to avoid that, right, Ken? Absolutely. We have a definite solar avoidance zone, and there are many safeguards in place on Hubble to make sure that we don't 
point that the sun, even as a last resort, closing the baffle on the front of the telescope. Right. Which you which you never want to do because you don't ever know if it's going to open. Oh, again. Right. <laughs> so why do we put so, what, so is that what it's there for? Just as an ultimate uh, safeguard against pointing at the sun? I mean, I've always wondered. It always it's always open, isn't it? It well, you know, we yes. never close it. No, we don't ever close it. Um, the only time we ever close it is during servicing missions. Right. right. So when the telescope's put into the payload bay of the shuttle. Okay. Um, and, but, and even then, we always worry would it open and, again. And, and, and even then. We don't release the telescope until we've opened it. Okay? <laughs> um, and but you're right, Tony. Uh, it's kind of the ultimate safeguard. Although if it had gotten to the point where sunlight was actually um, near enough to be going down the baffle that we close that door, we'd probably already have had problems. So in that sense, it, it's not terribly useful. Right. The, the right. other the other safeguards <laughs> that are in place are far more useful. Okay, we haven't gotten. Okay, I, 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 we're running out of time. I see we only have about 15 minutes left. And we haven't talked with Frank and Mario about theirs. Uh, Frank, how, you got a you got a favorite you'd like to share? Uh, actually, uh, let me share. Uh, go to the third image in mine and bring that up uh, on screen. Share. I'm going to do something in praise of dots. Okay, because we show a all candy? these beautiful images. Yeah. No, no, no. Like dots. Praise, in praise of the dots of uh, that Hubble sees, because this shows off Hubble's resolution. Okay. And pull that okay. up full screen. I think they're pulling it up for us. Yeah. All right, go to the next slide, and the next slide. <laughs> there we go. Okay. Good job. All right. Yeah. So this is the Pluto system. Okay, Pluto and Charon, and, and the four moons around them. Uh, Nix, Hydra, and then P4 and P5, which have been recently named Kerberos and Styx. And Hubble is the only telescope that can really see with such fine resolution to see these tiny little dots around Pluto way out at the edge of our solar system. And I like this image because it shows off the amazing resolution Hubble has, but what it also does is it shows that, you know, we think we know our solar system. We think, oh, there's nothing new in our own astronomical backyard, but here are, you know, we've known about Pluto and Charon since 1986, but all four of those moons were discovered by Hubble in the last you know, what is it, uh, since 2003? Uh, just a few. 2005, years. actually. Yeah, so eight years. Within yeah, the last decade. Less than, yeah, within yeah. the last decade. We've discovered these four new moons, and Hubble's resolution allows us to do that. Uh, and so our, our, ba our astronomical backyard really, uh, you know, we're learning new things with it. All right, and so let's skip that sort of a couple more because I want to, there, there's another red dot. Go, keep going. Or keep Pluto. going. That was red. Keep going. The next That's one, okay. And so I want to take that one step further um, and not planets around our own star, but I think one of the greatest things in our lifetime is the discovery of planets around other stars. I mean, this is you know the most compelling story we have to offer, that we are seeing other solar systems. And this image here, I, I know it looks like the Eye of Sauron from The Lord of the Rings, um, <laughs> but what it is is we're blocking out the light of this star called Fomalot. Okay, using that's what's called the chronographic mass to block it out, and you see this dust ring around it, and because the shape of the dust ring was sort of pulled off center, we suspected there might be a planet, and over on the right there's that small little box, and then the pullout that shows you Fomalhaut B, and the two images we got of it from 2004, 2006, to show it had a nice orbit around Fomalhaut, and really we're seeing a planet. Well, this is the first visible light image ever taken of a planet around another star. And so I, I brought up these two images to show you that, you know, research science is generally done with these dots, okay? You know, it's not, it's, yes, we get some fantastic, beautiful images, but, you know, some of the cutting edge, you know, I've always thought I should give a talk in praise of red dots because, you know, a lot of uh, our cutting edge science is done by just looking at these dots and the implication of these dots are just fantastic. Yeah, that is that is an amazing photo and or a uh, set of images actually. So the um uh the, the Hubble came and visited it twice. Oh, what what do you? No, what do you got there? Later, later. Go ahead. Go okay. Ahead. So the, uh, it visited it visited the uh, the system twice, and and it has a a mask in front of it that it uses to block out the the bright star. Is that what you said? Yeah, that's what the labeled in the image. The chronographic mask. Um, and so it's. It's, it's blocking out the light of Fomalhaut so we can see the faint things around it. Just like you would at sunset, you know, you put your hand up to block the sun so you can see the road as you're driving down. 
well, you know, we're doing that same sort of thing. So what's that? What's that ring there? What's uh? What's it about? Uh, well, this is a ring of dust and um, around the star form a lot. Uh, we have dust rings around a lot of stars. Uh, we believe that planetary systems all form in a nice uh, disk, and uh, we see a, a ring of dust around Fomalot that, you know, in which planets could be forming, or this could be far enough out that this could be a ring that might be similar to, say, the Kuiper Belt in our own solar system. Uh, this is this is an image, I believe this one was taken with the uh, Advanced Camera for Surveys, high resolution. Yeah, this channel. is the HRC. We okay. observed it more recently. With yeah, the we have since so visited it again. And in fact, in 2011. Yeah, and in fact, it continues along this orbit that's um, been predicted here. So there's a longer baseline available now too. Right, we got 2010 and 2012 images. Yeah. And the cool thing about those are that it's not on this nice orbit inside the ring. It actually extends. It's on a very elliptical orbit. Right, which is really even more cool. confusing and interesting. <laughs> which is why I went for this image because it's easier to understand. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Mario, Sorry, you want to share one with us? Uh, sure. Why not? Uh, maybe let's put the bullet cluster, which is the third from the top here. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good one. So, uh, no, it's not this one. It's a third chip. This one, yes. So this actually shows uh, the incredible synergy that you can have between two great space telescopes. Uh, this is a combination of Hubble with the Chandra X-ray Observatory. What we're seeing here are two clusters of galaxies colliding, and clusters of galaxies have in them uh, gas, normal gas, lots of hot gas, and that's what described here by the color red. But they also, we think, have around them dark matter. Dark matter is matter that doesn't shine any light. And we know it's there only because of its gravity. In fact, 23% of the density of the universe is in the form, we think, of dark matter. Now, this image is pretty amazing because dark matter interacts very weakly with anything else. I mean, basically, dark matter particles pass through one another without feeling each other. And that's what you see here in the blue. While the hot gas, the normal gas, when it collides, it really collides. And it forms a bow shock, which you can see on the right-hand side. You see the shock that forms, you know, like just when a boat goes through water or when a supersonic jet goes through air. You see that shock front that forms from the collision of the gas. So you see here a separation between the dark matter, which really passed through without feeling at all one the other, and the hot regular gas that shocked and formed this thing. So this, I believe, was actually the very first image that showed this kind of separation and really what we expected from dark matter. As I said, you know, other than dark energy, which is something else, uh, dark matter is the second most abundant form of energy in the universe, and we have seen here, uh, you know, how it is different from ordinary matter. So, Mario, I, I think it's worth mentioning that um, the red that you see there is the actual Chandra image. image. Yes. of that hot gas in the cluster. That's right. And then the blue is a representation of the dark matter, not the actual observation of the dark matter, but the representation of the dark matter derived from, from, gravitational the, from the gravitational lensing yes. that's seen within the Hubble image. That's right. The, the dark matter you cannot actually see, but you see its gravitational effect through a gravitational lensing, and therefore you can map it. We can map its location, and that's what the blue... Uh, region here shows. Yeah, that's beautiful. Uh, yeah, thanks for the clarification. Now, yeah, that was wanted to get to that because I, I know that um, you can't actually see the dark matter in any way. So mm -hmm. the way they they just look at the individual galaxy, uh, uh, len or the ones that have been lensed by the dark matter and, and mark it as being dark due to dark matter. Um, Carol, you have something you want to share with us? Yes. Any images? So um, in in the dots theme, so I have two images to show. One is um, a ground based image of what's called a globular cluster, okay. which is slide number six in my slide, so maybe if somebody can put that there up. We We're going to show yeah. that briefly. And then, That's a lot of dots. So it yeah. has lots of dots. 
Okay, so that's a ground-based image of something called a globular cluster, and its particular name is 47 Tucani because it's in Tucani, the constellation. Now, the Hubble image is the next image, and what's remarkable about it is it's only a tiny portion of this cluster um, that's being studied because this, the cluster is very big, and we can only see portions of it with the Hubble. Why, why are these objects important? Well, we've been talking about galaxies and lenses and galaxies far out in the universe, but these clusters are near us. They're in our galaxy, and they are the remnants. They are the old, old population that formed at the beginning of the formation of our galaxy. And so the, and the stars you're looking at are extremely old. And so we study these clusters, which most of my colleagues think they're really boring, but I like clusters. But every one of those dots is a star, and that's only a small portion of the whole cluster. But we study these to understand how do, do these clusters form and then what happens to them over the lifetime of the universe? What happens to the star? And so I love these images of clusters because they're nearby and they do tell an old, old, old story and we need to understand these old, old with the James Webb Telescope which are forming when these clusters formed. That's amazing. That is a great image. Okay, guys. Well, we are nearing um, we are nearing our time here uh, on what we think are some of the more amazing images by by Hubble. We could do this all day. They can You wouldn't believe how many images uh, oh, we had. So much more to put up. <laughs> I know. Tony, Tony, ahead, Tony. Tony. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry, Ken. Go ahead. We put it. up all these dots. Could we put up a few squiggly lines? Yeah. 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 Ten minutes. Yeah. By all means. I need one minute. <laughs> yes, absolutely. By all means, put it up. We should. We should mention while it's being put up, though, that you know, there are. There are more than just cameras on the Hubble, right? Uh, well, you want to talk about that? I mean, first of all, we have how many cameras and what other instruments are on Hubble right now? That are taking data. We have the advanced camera for surveys and the wide field camera three, which are the two primary cameras. Mm -hmm. Then we have the space telescope imaging spectrograph, which can take pictures but also takes spectra, and the cosmic origin spectrograph. Okay, so and and so when we say we don't want to limit you just to uh, visual images, if you. Uh, uh, if you think that some of the spectra from Hubble is also some of the most amazing or uh, greatest images taken, by all means, you're feel free to elect those as well. Uh, a spectrum is a beautiful thing. Yeah, I agree. And uh, th this one in particular uh, really floats my boat because it shows the presence of um, oxygen far, far away from galaxies uh, in the intergalactic medium. So what you're looking at here is light that's been passed through um, a good chunk of the universe on its way to Hubble and when it enters Hubble instead of taking a picture of that light Hubble diverts the light to a spectrograph which is an instrument that breaks light into its component colors um, so you see the colors here as a function of wavelength or you see the intensity of the light here as a function of wavelength in this case it's a very ultraviolet light and each of those little dips in that overall spectrum that you see there is the signature of different elements in the gas that the light has passed through. The, the intervening material leaves its imprint on the light um, from those distant objects. And in this particular case, um, the imprint is in the form of uh, highly ionized oxygen lines. And those highly ionized oxygen lines are tracers of the gas that eventually form galaxies. And so that's one of the things that I like. And if you look out at how much of the, you can do all kinds of things with spectra like this, including estimating how much gas is out there. And if you estimate um, the amount of oxygen that you see out there, and you convert that into um, mass, you realize that there's as much mass just associated with these oxygen systems as there is in galaxies as a whole. So there's a lot of material out there. Well, anyway. I don't understand. There's, a, there's as much oxygen by 
as there is other stuff there's in, in Galaxy? There's as much hydrogen associated with that oxygen as there is mass in galaxies, right? So, okay. So most <laughs> most of most of the mass in galaxies is in, the, is in the form of hydrogen, and you're using the oxygen here as a tracer, a, a, a proxy for that hydrogen, because you can't you can't observe the hydrogen directly associated with that very hot gas, but if you do the conversion, you find that there's as much hydrogen there in all of that gas that's forming galaxies as there is in the galaxies that you can actually see in Hubble images, for example. Oh, that's amazing. All so right. We, we could do a whole hangout on, on spectra, and I would oh, recommend that we do at some point. So. I think we should, yes. We, we spend an awful lot of time uh, talking about, <clears throat> talking about uh, the optical or two-dimensional pictures, but there's a lot to be gained from spectra as well, so I think we should. I like that idea. I mean, Hubble, Hubble spends about half of its time taking spectra. L let me add one thing. You see, it, there is all this gas that is between galaxies. We call this all this cosmic web. But you cannot really see that because that there is no light coming from that. So what you do is you use some very distant source point of light and you get that light to pass through all this cosmic web and on its way it's being absorbed by this gas. And that's what you see in these spectra. So these spectra really tell you the structure of this cosmic web that fills the entire space. Yeah, they're one-dimensional maps, you know, these probes along this one sight line through the universe. And through lots of various probes and uh, through uh, other theoretical studies, we've built up an idea of structure of the universe. And uh, it's amazing just how much we can learn uh, about the three-dimensional structure of the universe from these very, you know, one-dimensional sight lines through it. Awesome. Well, there you go, guys. I want to see uh, now. I want you guys to start showing me some spectra also in your submissions. So uh, I think there's a lot to begin. Well, I, th I think it's important. I mean, um, Alberto, Scott, this has been really great. I mean, this has been a lot of like this. This was this was one hangout I was very much looking forward to, and I'm really glad we got a chance to do this. Uh, you guys have any thoughts? Uh, I'm going to no. put up even more of the ones that we didn't actually get to yeah. share. There's right. so many more that we had set aside for this Hangout that we haven't even got to. <laughs> so I'm going to keep putting them up on the event page. Yeah. And let. And I really I really hope that you know the audience out there, either on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, find your images and let us know what you love and why you love it. More, more importantly, why. Yes, so that's very tell important. Tell us what, how it's inspired you. Since 1990, almost 25 years, on wanting to understand the universe and how it, I, I find looking out through Hubble and seeing these images really helps me find humanity inside those and so we can actually see where we've come from what we have in common with the rest of this expansive universe. Wow, There's nothing I can add to that. I know. Follow <laughs> that, Alberto. There you go, Alberto. Really? Yeah. Move. Yeah. I can. <laughs> I'm just saying that this should probably be part one of 99 because, you know, I was looking at all the images that we have. I wanted to talk about, you know, Hubble has looked at uh, planets in our solar system. We had a, a close encounter with a comet in, uh, in 94, I think, you know, Schumacher Levy. We saw it smashing on Jupiter. So there's incredible things that we've done from the very, very close by, you know, from our solar system all the way to the early universe, which is uh, probably... Uh, the, the most remarkable legacy the Hubble will uh, will leave us. That's right, and I would say I would argue that the Hubble Space Telescope is probably the most important scientific instrument built by humanity. And I would even I include the LHC in that statement. I'd love to see, uh, you know, I mean, yes, yes, you know, CERN is doing a lot of great work, but I still would put Hubble up against it any day. I'd love to see a. a <laughs> Let me see a sm yeah. smackdown, a smackdown on that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and LHC the data is Hubble. all yours. <laughs> that, that is true. Uh, Which excellent, excellent point. Excellent point, Carol. It. That's right. Go excellent point. Get it. Excellent point. That that it is available available for you to get all the time. In fact, we're going to talk about that a little bit tomorrow on our Comet Ison hangout, where you can get hum Hubble data yourselves. So, guys, thank you for all, all to all of you for participating. This was a lot of fun. I hope Hubble huggers, you guys get out there. And or do you have something you want to say, Carol? No, I'm just I'm oh, giving just doing, the Queen's oh, wave. Oh, <laughs> that's so yes. Oh. <laughs> That's, yes. Thank you to all the little people out there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Ken, Frank, Mario, um, uh, Frank, and Carol. Thank you very. Oh, and Zolt. Sorry, you're on the wrong side of my screen there. Thank you all very much for uh, 
for, for participating, taking time out of your day to talk to us about let's, Hubble Pictures. Let's do it again real soon. Yeah, yeah I, think, I think you and I are. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, so we'll see, we'll see you tomorrow probably. Sure. Uh, yep. uh, Scott, Alberto, this has been great. Thank you both very much. Thank you. Uh, let me remind everybody that the way to uh, interact and let us know what you think is to post on this event page. Use the hashtag Hubble Top Shots to get our attention on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, also, go to the, the Hubble Space Telescope uh, community. Start posting in there, and uh, just just you know, you can even uh, uh, email us uh, at, at. Well, we don't have an email address, I guess, for this. So I guess never mind. But <laughs> you can inter tweet us. Inter, inter tweet us, right? Right. Um, so anyway, I hope you guys will participate. We're looking forward to compiling this list. We will post it. I think we're going to stop taking submissions on the. It's early next week. I should have probably had that date. I thought um, it was the 18th, but I can't remember. Yeah, the 18th. That sounds about right. So you have until then to, get, to give us your submissions. Looking forward to seeing what you guys come up with. Thank you guys for watching. And as always, keep looking up. Bye, everyone. <laughs>